but it is easy to speak of the past, impossible to go there. I am powerful in ways you can only dream, yet I am still a prisoner of what I have done. I can never escape the cell I have made for myself, and things are what they are. Welcome to my life of constant doubt, anxiety, and occasional sudden and unpredictable horror, Jabra. I hope you enjoy your fucking visit. What's up, bookworms? I am Mike, and today we're going to be talking about Sharpens Tales from the World of the First Law by Joe Abercrombie. Now, this is a small collection of short stories taking place within the First Law universe. And I just want to say before we begin, there has been a slight format change here from when I first started doing First Law book reviews. I got some feedback from some constant watchers that folks kind of wanted to be sold on some of these books. So I will be doing a few minutes of non spoiler discussion at the beginning, and then I'll get into spoilers. So if you have not read, all of the first law books prior to a little hatred coming out in september of 2019 uh watch up until i tell you the spoilers are starting bookmark this video and come back after you do so with that said let's get into it with some non-spoiler thoughts on sharp ends uh, i'll say up front that uh even with people knowing how big of a fan of the first law i am I am pretty lukewarm to short story collections as a whole. I mean, even with Stephen King, who's released some really good ones, uh, short story collections usually just kind of piss me off because, you know, right when they're starting to get good, they're over. And they just, they just, they just end rather abruptly. And that, that that isn't to say this is a poor collection by any stretch. Not at all. I just do not care for the structure of these types of collections. They're just never, the flow is never really there for me. Um, I think the Last Wish book from the Witcher series, that was the exception of this because Sepkowski kind of structured it in a way that it had this overarching story with numerous, hey, remember when this happened? And then we went into the story and that kind of tied everything together with, you know, it had that one main mainline story going on for it. And I think that's what I liked it. And, and it's somewhat similar here since a lot of the characters and events and, and the settings from these six main novels show up or they're mentioned. So it's not like you're just going into this ice cold like you did with The Witcher and you kind of needed that. Uh, but the, the first and last stories are probably my favorite ones here. Uh, it was really cool to see Glockta again, uh, you know, before his capture and torture by the Gurkers. So I guess you're seeing him in his prime. That was really cool. Uh, and then getting a bombshell story at the end of the book really just left me with my mouth hanging open. And just looking at the original trilogy in a whole different layer now. Uh, so that was something I did not expect to get in this book. But uh, for as much of how I was not a fan of Red Country, uh, there are a couple characters in with stories in this book. And, um, you know, most of you guys know how I felt about that novel. But just like with that book, I really liked one of those stories. And the other one is on a character I could do without ever hearing from in this universe again. So uh, I'll get more into that in spoilers. But... Uh, I really like seeing characters from the heroes again, and and if those do not turn up in the new trilogy, I mean it'll suck. But hey, I'm ready for Joe to create some new characters that I know I'll come to love by the time I'm reviewing that trilogy. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, I'll say this: this this collection does have a main character in a duo with uh, Shev and Javra. If I'm saying Javra wrong, I'm sorry. I, I kept wanting to say Javerte from fucking, uh, what, uh, Les Mis. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, if it's if, if I'm saying it awfully wrong. And yes, guys, I know the audiobooks are amazing. I just don't listen to audiobooks. I just, I, so I don't know if I'm saying these words right. So please feel free to, to, to correct me if it's not pronounced Javra. Uh, I believe these two, Shev and Javra, they've they had about five stories out of the 13 collected here. And it kind of chronicles how their friendship changes over the course of 19 years in this brutal world. And, and I did like their pairing, but it really did kind of make me wish that this collection had just been turned into a straight novel about their adventures that took place over that time span with mentions 
of the world events going on around them and the cameos from some of our uh, you know now favorite characters. But again, I think that's more of my criticism uh, as a whole on the short story collection thing than it is really of of what Joe's wrote here. So so yes, if you've read the six novels, I think there's plenty to like here. Uh, except for the last story, I'm not sure there's anything you'll feel is a must read. Uh, unless Chev and Javra turn up in the sequel trilogy, then it would be like, oh yeah, you really should read this. Uh, but I think you'll enjoy this well enough if you're a big fan of the series and, and a big fan of, of Joe Abercrombie. And I mean, that's 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 really about all I had to say about uh, spoiler talk. So, uh, I'm sorry for non-spoiler talk. So before I start spoiler talk, I'm going to do a little bit of house cleaning here and take a quick second and ask you to help me out by hitting that subscribe button. Uh, the channel is growing. We passed that original goal of 500 subscribers. I got a new goal of 750. Uh, before the end of 2019, I feel like that's somewhat realistic. I was just a hair under 600 before I started recording this. Uh, so if you like this video, please subscribe. Check out the other content on the channel. Uh, I do a video every single week, uh, a, a book video every single week, and we also do a live video uh, called Geek Media Core, where we just go through all of the uh, big events that happen in pop culture during the week, uh, unless there's just like nothing going on. Then we just kind of like we haven't done one in a couple of weeks now. But uh, please hit subscribe, share these with your friends, and I'll keep making them as long as you keep watching them. So let's hit up some spoiler talk. Now, I plan to bring up each story and talk about what I did and did not like for each. Obviously, I'll talk about some more than others. Some were kind of forgettable. Some were really, really great. So, spoilers talk, spoiler talk starts now. Uh, and again, this is for all six books. will probably come up in this. So, if you haven't read the entire series up to this point... Let me get my notes ready here. Uh, I would say turn away now because I am not going to. I'm sorry, guys. I'm so unprepared sometimes. Uh, let's see here. I don't have the list of the, of the books here. All right. Uh, first up, we have A Beautiful Bastard. This takes place about nine years before the blade itself. And the bastard mentioned is none other than mine and many others' favorite character in this universe, Sand Dan Galacta. But this is now, you know, not how we've ever seen him. You know, he's handsome. He's quick afoot. He's super confident and cocky, and he knows it, and and he's the object of Salem Rue's infatuation. So you know already we we got another layer to him, basically to torturing Salem Rue's in the in the opening chapters of the first book. So that that adds something to it there. But the problem with this is that it is only seventeen pages long. You know I feel like the events at the bridge with the Gurkish has been talked about so much in the original trilogy, and I just kind of want more, and this just ended. Ah, it was a great opener, and it was really cool to see Glockta and Major West again. But right off the bat, man, I, I get what I do not like about short stories. Right when they're getting good, they just pull the rug out from under you and close that door. Uh, but even then, I, I think this is probably my second favorite story here, simply because of the nostalgia bomb. You know, uh, The nostalgia I have for these characters, um, West and Glockta, uh, that was really cool. And I, yeah, I think you also said Tunny in there, so there's a nice little little uh, extra layer from uh, from the heroes there. Next up, we have Small Kindnesses. This takes place two years before the blade itself. Uh, this is our introduction to Chev and her eventual meeting with Jabra. It's somewhat of a redemption story for Chev and showing that, you know, there are some lines that even a thief won't cross. Uh, so, you know, already there you got the whole great character thing. Uh, I like this one in hindsight more than I did when I first read it. Once I realized that these two were going to be showing up frequently throughout the collection. Uh, whereas at first, you know, I just kind of thought it was pointless. But uh, yeah, in hindsight, viewing these five stories as a whole, uh, this one made a little bit more sense. And it was an interesting first meeting. Uh, moving on to The Fool Jobs. This is one year before the blade itself. Uh, we get our first returning characters from the standalone trilogy. And I did like seeing Kermit and Crawl and, and, and his crew again. But to be honest, I kind of forgot what their mission in the story was before I even finished it. But, I mean, the, the highlight here was just seeing this group and their banter and how they interact with each other once again. And that's what I enjoyed the most about that one. Um, I, I know when I first started the hero, like the first half of the heroes, I kind of struggled with. And then the second half, I absolutely loved. And in hindsight, I said that, that, that the arrow is definitely pointing up on that book. Uh, I still don't like it as much as Best Served Cold, but, man, it's leaps and bounds ahead of Red Country for me. Uh then we get our, what I guess, I, get full, I did full jobs. Yeah, we get our continuation of Chev and Jabra in Skipping Town. This one takes place at the same time as The Blade itself. Uh, all these stories go in chronological order by year until the last one. And the bombshell that's released in that last one, I think, is why they did it that way. 
But um, this one's got it's got plenty of fun and action. You know that the small kindness is, was, was kind of lacking, but it's way too short. Again, it sets up Jabber's arc in this collection about her going AWOL on this uh, religious warrior order. I forgot to write down what it was called. Um, but apparently she's just like bailed on this and, you know, they've come to, to find her. And with all of Chev and, and, and Jabber's story, I like them together much more than the single stories. Um, I really don't know what the point I was trying to make there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, next is where I really started having fun, and that's with stories that show the chaos from the other six points. Are the other six the other six books from the point of view of the characters that were not in those trilogies? With Hell, uh, we get to see what I thought was easily the best part of Red Country, and that's a POV from Temple, uh, a younger Temple, because this one takes place during the siege of Glock. I'm sorry, the siege of Dagaska, and before they are hanged. You know where uh, where Glockta was kind of instead of seeing things from uh, Glockta's defense of the city role, we get to see it from those who were on the losing side of it after Glockta bailed to go back to Adua. You know, we get to see how the eaters confronted those that were left behind. Uh, but the, the biggest, the, the the biggest part of this story was seeing the selfless sacrifice of Haddish Kadia. I mean, we assumed that he died here. Uh, we never really knew what exactly happened to him. Uh, forget the general was it Viseric? I, I can't remember which which general was that basically like commit suicide so he wouldn't be because I think uh, Glock told him you would rather commit suicide than be taken prisoner by the Gurkish. But she obviously, you know, uh, Kadia, highly religious, he says, you know, taking one's own life is, you know, against God. And it, it was it was both amazing and heartbreaking to see his sacrifice here. Um, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, cool, I got some closure on the character. Gosh, did I really want to see that? And this is probably my third favorite story in this book. And it, it being from the point of view of a, a, a young temple and you're already seeing that he has the problems with always wanting to run. And you can see why here. This makes sense. So, I mean, it's an extra layer to temple there. So that already, that already makes his character better for me uh, as to all my problems with Red Country. Uh, during the same time period, we have the third Chev and Jabra story in Two's Company. Uh, of the five, this is my favorite one of their adventures. Uh, their encounter with Cracknet Weirin, gold. It was just gold. It was the highlight here for sure. Uh, he was the, the the character that died in the heroes that I hated. Uh, hated to see happen. I love the character. I hated to see his death happen. Uh, so just getting more from him and the Father of Swords. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Obviously, the the little rivalry that comes up between him and, and Jabber is it, it, just it's just so much fun. It's lots of what Abercrombie does so well. The fun and the wit with this one. It's everything we love about this world that he's constructed. Fantastic. Just a great time. Uh, with Wrong Place, Wrong Time, we move into the events of the standalone trilogy as it takes place during uh, a lot of the events in Best Served Cold. And what I loved about this is much like Hell, uh, the, the one where there's the bank heist from banks from Best Earth Cold, it shows the chaos and the effect on others that the main narrative characters had on the world and its people. Uh, my favorite one here is is the bank heist during Morvir deciding just to poison the entire staff on hand to make sure that he gets Malthus. Uh, and it's the pandemonium that you expect, but seeing it from someone, you know, a, a spectator's point of view is... Uh, Again, just shows just how bonkers that was. But also seeing Gorsh again is always going to be fun. He pops up more than once in this book, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I enjoyed this one. Maybe it's because I think I know that Best Served Cold is my favorite part of the standalone trilogy. I feel like it stands right there with the original three. So, uh, yeah, seeing these characters, anytime you see these characters or their, or their actions and what they caused on others is always going to be something I'm going to be uh, having a good time with. Um, I'm going to save some time in this review and save you some time reading and tell you that maybe you should just, I'm sorry, I'm going to suggest that maybe you should just go ahead and skip some Desperado because it's a story about maybe the least interesting character that Joe has ever written in Shy South. I did not intend for this to be a straight up bash Red Country video. Uh, it, it is what it is. I just, I don't care for Shy South. She's totally boring. Nothing about her gets me excited. Nothing about that setting gets me excited. And like I said, I'm fine if Joe just never writes about any of the Red Country characters or settings again, unless it's Logan. Uh, but that's just me. That's just me. If you love Red Country, maybe you'll be fine with this one. 
this was the only time that the book dragged for me. Uh, with Yesterday Near a Village Called Barden, I think it's slightly before the events of the heroes, or it might be happening at the same time. I think it's before because we see Gorse writing the letters to, to uh, King Gisol, but I think he does that all through the book, so it could be taking place at the same time. Um, but, so just say we get more of, of, of Bremer here, and that's always welcome for me. Uh, like the last story, it shows the impact on the characters that weren't the narrative focus during the novels, like these farmers are having their crop ruined their crop ruined because of the war between the North and the Union. Uh, and I think little things like that helps flesh out this world and make it feel more lived in. So while no major events really happen in these these books, it, it just shows the effect on the little people. And, and, and I like that. I like that. Uh, in Threes, A Crowd, we return to Chev and Javra, this time between the heroes and the Red Country uh, timeline. Their story here is fine, but for me, it was really, it was seeing the rule of Mansa and her successfully uniting Styria and crowning her and Rogan's kid. Or is it? No, is it Rogan's kid? Uh, this is the one I think is going to tie into the sequel trilogy. Uh, they talk about how King Gisal has had some battles with Mansa and lost. There's been people who have questioned if that's really her and Rogan's kid, and you know, it talks about their heads being put up on spikes. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely getting this stuff in a little hatred, and I can't wait, man. I can't wait, because you know how much I love Best Served Cold. And this one kind of felt like an epilogue to Best Served Cold, more so than it did a, a Shev and Jabber story, at least to me. And I'm good with that. I mean, we even see Vitari again. But, uh, but we do get more uh, of, of her abandoning her order or whatnot, and you find out that... Uh, the head of that order is her own mother, and that's why it's been like 15 years at this point. And they're still chasing her, so um, she agrees to, uh, to to go back to work for them if she uh, if she gets this item from a from a magi, which I am going to assume she's talking about the seed from the original trilogy, uh, getting it from uh, from Baez. I don't know. I don't know because in the last story we have like this huge MacGuffin, and I don't know if that's supposed to be the seed or not. I doubt it because I. All they talk about is, is it's just wrapped in a piece of cloth. And I mean, they had to put it in like this lead box in the in the original trilogy. So uh, if this and the last story, if that's the same item, then it definitely is not the seed. But I, who knows? Who knows? In Freedom, you would think that I would like this because it was a Nikon Wakaska story. But it's a full propaganda version of, from like a writer talking about Nikon Wakaska's actions at the Averstock Liberation. And I mean, it makes sense that it was done this way, but I'd have rather just had a story about Casca during the time when he was fun and I enjoyed the character, not the version of him during Red Country that I did not care for. Uh, I mean, other than Casca's, you know, couple sentences re review at the end of the story, uh, this one was kind of forgettable. And that's that's a shame because, you know, I didn't like the way that Casca went out and I was hoping it would have something fun with Casca in this. But hey, it is what it is. In Tough Times All Over, we go two years after the events of Red Country, taking us further in the First Law timeline than we've been. And we get the final Chev and Jabra story, which is, if I'm being honest, kind of anticlimactic in that regard. Because, I mean, it, this one, it reminded me of those chapters in The Heroes where Joe switched the POV from whoever got the last kill during the battle. But this time, it's whoever has possession of this MacGuffin that I mentioned. And, you know, it has everything I love about Joe's writing style but not quite the ending I was wanting with Chev and Jabra. So I, I, I'm wondering if they're going to show up uh, in the sequel trilogy, or who knows, maybe we'll have more stories of them down the line. Maybe he does another short story collection and they're in it. We'll see. It just didn't feel like the proper ending for what they what he built up for them in the first four stories. But for the finale, this is, whew, this is good. We go back in time to five years before the events of the Blade itself, and this one is a mindfuck. Uh, it's from the POV of Bethed. So that's already awesome. You know, I said that I felt like I wish we had gotten more about Bethed instead of him just being like this shadowy figure in the background of the original trilogy. And seeing young Calder and Scale, you know, that's nice after getting to know them better in the heroes. But seeing the Bloody Nine when he's even more unpredictable than he was in the original trilogy is nuts. Uh, it's kind of like if you read Brandon Sanderson's uh, Stormlight Archive. Uh, with Dalinar, you constantly hear in the first two books about how much of a monster Dalinar used to be, and how he just used to be just a tyrant, a piece of shit, but you just can't see it because you like him. 
Then you get his flashbacks in, in the third book, and he's basically Hitler, and you're just in shock. You know, Logan wasn't exactly a great dude in the trilogy, but he had more redeeming qualities than not. He was trying to be a better man, as he put it. So, in this, he's just such a wild card that even Dogman and Bethet are scared of him. You know, for me, it really puts the original trilogy in a new perspective because the good guy lost in that battle. It, Beth had truly wanted peace and to end the conflicts, and Logan fucked that up, man. I I was just completely stunned. We now know why Logan and Beth had had their big falling out, and it's completely justified. Man, what a way to end this book. And just... All the time, I just came here about why, why, why are these people against Bethed? And now I'm even more like, why are these people? Why were they? Why were these northern? Why were the name men? Why was Logan's crew? Why were they against Bethed? I mean, I was just completely stunned. Bethed tried to bring peace, and I mean, is it just because? I mean, obviously, I know like Black Dow, the dude just was like, I don't even want, I don't want peace. And of course, then in Heroes, he did want peace. So uh, maybe you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? Or where's it? Maybe it's the neck that wears the chain. Maybe we'll put it that way. But yeah, just a great end of this book. Uh, it just kind of completely floored me. And that alone made reading this worth it. Uh, I just can't say enough about it. It's fantastic. I mean, wish it had been more. You know, <laughs> I'll say that with all the ones that I liked in this book, of all this, uh, all the uh, the short stories, is I just I wish there were more. But uh, this leads us to the countdown now to the sequel trilogy. I started my reread of the original trilogy back in March, and I did one book per month of my first time reading of the standalone trilogy and Sharp Ends leading up to the release of A Little Hatred. Now we're just over a month away. But man, it's been a ton of fun getting to talk to you guys about it. I mean, that's that's made even even better, this go-around. I mean, I don't know that I was ever going to read the uh, the standalones until the, the, the sequel trilogy was announced. So I'm glad that I did because, I mean, Best Served Cold, I think, is right up there with the first three, like I said. But the, the lead up to A Little Hatred is just a month from now. I do plan to do like a thoughts and theories kind of video discussion or something. So worry not, there will be more First Law content coming before my video review of A Little Hatred. So, um... guys and I will talk with you soon.